Our first speaker is Ijaz Hussain. Dr. Hussain began his career in teaching first at the Ohio Northern University and then at the University of Cincinnati. He then moved to the FDA where he reached the position of Deputy Director of the Office of Pharmaceutical Science between 1995 and 2004. His most recognisable contribution at the FDA was the establishment of biopharmaceutical classification guidance, championing the PAT and pharmaceutical quality for the 21st century initiative, and serving as the FDA's lead for quality at ICH and facilitating the progress of ICH Q8, Q9 and Q10. In addition to his role at FDA, Dr. Hussain has extensive industry experience and a background in academic research and teaching to include several high-level corporate leadership positions. And so, without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to Ajaz Hussain. Ajaz? I'm Ajaz Hussain, and it's my pleasure to join you to discuss transforming pharmaceutical manufacturing. I wish to share with you my perspective on FDA's 21st century initiative. Several technologies come together to form a platform for pharmaceutical manufacturing. This platform must deliver control and assurance of quality over the life cycle of a product to justify that pharmaceuticals are better than placebo in the clinic and in the real world. Transformation becomes necessary when a system's suitability and capability is unable to keep up with the increasing complexity and uncertainty in which it must operate. Towards the end of the 20th century, it was apparent as it was evident that our practices and our controls were not adequate and they were not keeping up with increasing level of complexity of materials and products. It was also apparent that we were moving into an experience economy. In an experience economy, how consumers feel about a product and a service becomes more and more important to them, perhaps at a point more important than the product itself. Assurance of quality in and of itself is, a, is critical to the experience in the real world. Therapeutic outcomes that patients experience in the real world are significantly influenced by how they feel about a product. And therefore, assurance is a critical bridge between pre-market and commercial worlds and clinical and the real world. Reliable validity and predictability were among the key drivers for the 21st century initiative. Approaching validation methods, processes, and development of a product and process occurring in parts left a lot to be desired. A systems approach to product development, process development, and seamless technology transfer and process validation uh, and predictable scale-up uh, were key, including um, minimizing the need for pre-approval supplements uh, for many of the post-approval changes. In late 1990s, FDA had embarked on the scale-up and post-approval change guidelines. There, though supported by research, um, the recommendations for changes um, were to a large extent um, uh, a consensus of opinions of what is, what is uh, high risk, what is low risk, what is medium risk, and uh, allocation of uh, uh, 
changes being affected, supplement, prior approval, supplement, and prior approval uh, and, and annual reports. Um, we wanted to refine that in a way that we reduce uh, the need for prior approval supplement to to almost an extent that uh, we have uh, uh, minimized that only for changes in specifications. And the whole notion of design space was the notion of make your own SUPAC, uh, was, was the idea that we started with. A systems approach uh, to quality management uh, was, was the focus, but the whole idea of process analytical technology guideline being a system, not just an analytical document, uh, was, was emphasized. And the bridge between uh, development reports um, and, and process validation and process control had to be seamlessly uh, uh, traversed. Uh, it was the hope uh, or the wish of the initiative. So I wanted to share a bit more on, on, on some of the technical challenges with examples, and I'll get to that in a minute. But for now, I want you to think about the four different types of systems based on whether the uh, cause and effect relationships are self-evident or evident to experts uh, or are only evident after experimentation or after the fact or are not predictable um, uh, because of extreme sensitivity to starting conditions. That would be chaotic, complex uh, system would be ones where uh, cause and effect relationships are not predictable uh, and not known until you do your research and development. And complicated systems are ones which uh, cause and effect relationships are known, but you need an expert uh, um, expertise to be able to interpret those cause and effect relationships, uh, perhaps uh, multivariate aspects. And simple ones, a simple system is one where cause and effect relationships are self-evident without the need for additional um, uh, education, training, and experience. And in that regard, good practices uh, apply to complicated systems, best practices to simple systems, complex systems have emergence, the emerging practices or emergence and and if you don't manage that correctly you run into emergencies and chaotic systems are not predictable beyond uh, uh, the average uh, because of extreme sensitivity to initial conditions and um, such systems uh, uh, the extreme sensitivity is also known as the butterfly effect but such systems have often what is called strange attractors, where the patterns emerge in the system. So we'll come back to that later. Science-based risk assessment was the objective of the initiative. Predictive, quantitative, quality risk assessment uh, was the, the emphasis of the initiative. Out of specification, observations, and root cause unknown were, were prevalent. And root cause, the mindset is applicable for special cause variabilities. Something unusual happens. But out of specifications that we observe happen as common out of specification dissolution issues and so forth, which run across the sector. And root cause unknown, and, and or you blame the analyst or blame the operator, uh, was not a satisfactory way of uh, perpetuating um, the notion of uh, uh, adequate investigations and corrective actions and preventive actions. Pharmaceutical quality is multivariate. And our approach to quality has been um, univariate, uh, one test at a time and so forth, and not necessarily looking at the potential interactions, interrelationships between the attributes and the methods that we use and so forth. So, so univariate cause unknown um, uh, is what, uh, what we land up with uh, as root cause unknown for common cause uh, variances. And we wanted to move towards multivariate uh, uh, root cause investigations and corrective action and preventive action, move towards statistical process control. And once a uh, system is in a state of control, continual improvement can begin. 
corrective action, preventive action is not continual improvement. And continual improvement can only begin once you have established a state of control. And clearly, I think opening the door for advancement, advanced technology, advanced manufacturing and innovation in manufacturing was also uh, on our minds. So wanted to share with you a case example, a case example that uh, I have had the opportunity to observe while I was at FDA, then uh, at, at companies I worked at and as a consultant and advisor to companies. So I have this, this, this example, I have an opportunity to view that, that challenge from multiple viewpoints. And, and in 2014, um, because of the recurring uh, recalls of this product and uh, there was an outcry from patients and, and physicians and FDA responded to that by doing additional testing, including bio studies on, on products and found them to be acceptable. And uh, both companies had major warning letters because of their uh, GMP related issues. And uh, the FDA spokesperson uh, on 2014 uh, gave this comment. Recalls were the result of company's own test. Now, I want you to remember that those phrase, company's own test, which FDA has approved, and FDA in the review process insisted on that test to be included. And so the irony or the paradox in that statement is something I want you to think in your mind. So I, what I'll do now is I will share with you some slides which, uh, which describe the 21st century initiative and then talk to you about this case example, which is a modified release tablet of metoprolol succinate and look at the uh, aspects of FDA review and then the subsequent challenges to one complete response letter that I was an advisor to help that resolve. So I want to share these, these examples with you and, and I want you to think about how do you reconcile this statement uh, with what are the facts on the ground. So 16th of November 2001 was the first FDA science board meeting. Among the many speakers were uh, Steve Hammond and Norman Winskill from Pfizer who came in and talked about their, their frustration as well as their uh, no choice option to say, we have adopted a don't use and don't tell approach to new technology, especially the process and nickel technology. We don't use it because uh, FDA will not accept it and our applications get delayed uh, because of more questions. And, but we have to sometimes use it and we use it, but we won't tell FDA. We'll do the FDA, uh, give FDA the same test that they want for the compendial test, uh, but we have to control our products with, with advanced technology, which we do in parallel. The other presentation was Dr. GK Raju, which I'm showing here, which deals with a modified release dosage form similar to one I'm gonna to talk to you about, metropolis succinate in the sense that um, I don't know which uh, system Dr. G.K. Raju's data are related to, but all I know it is modified release dosage forms. But given the average cycle time is 95 days, I have a fairly good sense of why this is relevant to the case example I will share with you shortly. So in this case, uh, average cycle time uh, was 95 days. Standard deviations were more than 100 days. Now, that is a signal to think about uh, when the standard deviation of a measure is bigger than um, uh, uh, average cycle time. Not mathematically, but it does create a chaos in the system on the business process systems because the system is unpredictable and there's something that is sensitive to the initial conditions of that uh, manufacturing process. Not mathematically, but from a business process perspective. And the capacity utilization of the system was low, about 10%. It was too embarrassing to put 10 there, so we had left it low. 
So in order not to stock out the major company, these are the top big pharma companies, they essentially have excess capacity so that they don't stock out. When you look at um, overall cycle times as a function of the lot number, the 96 days, 95 days is around the bottom of the, the figure here, and you can count how many uh, hundreds of days it takes to resolve um, lots with exceptions or out of specification findings, and then what's the difference between lot without exceptions and uh, lots with exceptions. So the exceptions are OS, uh, I think without exceptions also can, can get be delayed, but you can see it is uh, almost chaotic. On 9th of April 2002, the second advisory board meeting occurred and Dr. Woodcock, the center director, herself made this presentation on some of the challenges that uh, from an FDA perspective, uh, she wanted to highlight. Industry concern about re uh, regulatory implication of results for adopting process and technology. Uh, closer scrutiny will reveal variation in existing products missed by current mode of sampling. Uh, it will delay approval of new products. And she used the dissolution test as an example. And I still recall the scramble of the statisticians at FDA to put this presentation together for Dr. Woodcock uh, and uh, not realizing that compendial tests uh, have built in type one, type two errors and, and pass no pass uh, type of zero tolerance criteria. They were intended, they are intended for being market standards, not necessarily designed for modern quality control testing. And in that sense, um, uh, even if you have a perfectly good product, the likelihood of passing a batch is not 100%, it is less than 100%. And in this case, if I take the variance of the system as variance of the measurement system, variance of the product and, and random variation, this is only reflecting variance of the product in the most ideal sense. It's not even accounting for variance in the measurement system. And so about 4% of batches fail, although there's no different than passing batches. That's the inherent problem with this. But what I would suggest to you is that the 4% batches is the least uh, 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 number one can expect. When you factor in the measurement system variability and other things that can go wrong, the, the likelihood of passing a batch cannot be 100%. You cannot be right first time in pharma by design because each tablet has three, four, five uh, compendial tests with such built-in variability. So how can the right first time rate in pharma be 100% or, or Six Sigma? Or, or So that's the fundamental problem. And most people still don't understand that aspect. I think for me, the eye-opening event uh, that really sunk in deep in my psyche and then my soul in one sense was uh, when uh, dissolution failures had become um, uh, a national security issue because Marines, U.S. Marines are given mefloquine tablets as prophylaxis. And, and uh, when Marines started coming down with malaria, the Congress asked us question to CDC and to FDA to investigate what happened. So our investigation focused on whether the generic mefloquine tablets, uh, which is given to Marines, uh, was problematic or not. So we collected samples from the Marines and we tested and the two labs, the two best FDA labs that did the testing came up with so different results uh, that I scratched my head and I asked for the first time <laughs> after being in the business for some, such a long time, did you validate this method? And they looked at me strangely. Of course we did. I said, tell me how. And, and then they started explaining how they validated the HPLC method uh, for the taking dissolution sample. I said, how do you validate the dissolution apparatus? That part. Oh, we don't validate that. We calibrate that. I said, who, how do you calibrate? We use calibrated tablets from the USP. Who makes the calibrator? At that time, it was graduate students at University of Maryland. I said, did we ever investigate, inspect the University of Maryland labs? Never. And then they tell me that Calibre tablet is unstable and it keeps shifting. And the worst thing was they tell me that uh, uh, 
the acceptance criteria for the calibrator tablet uh, is about 30% wide. And I said, oh, God, our guidance says we set um, uh, specifications for modified release plus minus 10%. How do you reconcile all this variance? We don't. We just let things go. And here is, here is a memo that uh, one of the labs uh, wrote to me as as a we are at loss to explain the difference between DPA and then Philadelphia lab, and blah, 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 blah. And what that triggered was a recognition that our reference materials, our methods, measurement systems are based on the 19th century model of thinking and for 19th century level of control and assurance. And if we want to progress, we have to do differently about our measurement system uncertainty of our calibration. The calibration standards have to be I'll use broadly is the Six Sigma. Uh, what is the quality of the reference uh, standard for calibration? Are we doing reproducibility and repeatability study? Are we doing gauge RNR because this is a district? All those discussions happen and we went to ASTM to establish a more rigorous mechanical calibrator and, 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 and at least as a bridge to the solution. So that, I think, was, was a very uh, important uh, aspect uh, of, uh, of uh, that effort back in early 2000s. And I think what other aspect is not well understood is that uh, this is um, uh, FDA Office of Compliance with the issuance of uh, process validation guideline in 2011 uh, had, had, has been reminding the community that, look, the compendial tests are market standards. They are never intended for batch testing. And there is a disclaimer in the USP, which says the similarity to statistical procedure may seem to suggest an intent to make inference to some larger group of units. But in all cases, statements about whether the compendial standards is met apply only to the unit tested. So I think this is a gap which measurement system uncertainty that remains unaddressed. And um, previously, if you recall, our validation was to a large extent um, uh, get the best, get the same lot of raw materials, get the best people. You pray five times and cross your fingers and you make those three batches uh, for process qualification and you're validated for rest of your life. That was the old model. And, and how representative are those validation batches to the commercial batches? And how reliable is that valid, valid validation, I think, was, was the key. And I think that's where the process validation 2011 in conjunction with uh, PAT, um, uh, ICHQ8, and Q9 tried to bridge those gaps uh, to help improve the reliability of validities, I think, the phrase I used previously. So let me, um, as, as we were progressing in this, we started getting examples and after examples after examples. I think one example which was mind-boggling to me was when John Murray Joffrey, he used to be, when he visited FDA in 2004, uh, he was with uh, Abbott and he showed a case example of the failures and dissolution tests that occur for the modified release dosage form uh, when they move the manufacturing from Chicago to Puerto Rico. And the mind-boggling aspect of that was it was identical plant, identical everything. And yet uh, the dissolution failures started occurring when you transfer it to Puerto Rico. And he found a correlation uh, between dew point of the weather bureau of Puerto Rico and, and, and the dissolution failure. That can't be because it's the environmentally controlled and so forth. But yet the shipment of excipients from uh, Michigan, uh, Dow Chemicals to to um, to Chicago versus Puerto Rico, um, the the polymer here is HPMC uh, was sufficient to make a difference that the hydration rates uh, differed, and the only solution there was uh, for Abbott to go back to Dow Chemical and get a cut of hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, which had the right hydration rate. Although everything is USP, but that USP material uh, did not uh, serve the purpose uh, for this. I just wanted to show uh, that example because that example remains in my mind that uh, we often neglect 
that the starting materials, our excipients, the functional attributes, the physical attributes of that, uh, we don't have those in our certificate of analysis. We don't um, uh, think about those. And unless you think from a multivariate systems perspective, a lot of these special causes go, uh, go uh, um, undetected and we put, blame the analyst. I think the other example that I want to share with you is with quality by design. Um, I think uh, uh, Pat Sinko, um, uh, who was at uh, Pfizer, now he's at uh, BMS, and uh, Reed came to FDA's uh, advisory committee and how they approach dissolution uh, performance uh, in a quality by design mode and in a in a in a multivariate systems way to think about the mechanism mechanisms leading to that and their complaint was the way FDA enforces dissolution specification after the design is done, after the clinical studies is done, in the last very minute they'll say tighten the specification and that's so detrimental because the product for which uh, the new specification is, is, is FDA insists on, the product was not designed for that specification and so the whole idea was to move specification setting for new drugs to end of phase two so that you have a confirmation. You don't um, you know, bend the, um, uh, have forced the companies to change Titan specification after the clinical studies are done to for that purpose. So I think that that still is a gap that remains. And I think I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, uh, recalls uh, from 2007 to 2012. This is what uh, Dr. Mansoor Khan, uh, when he was at FDA, was able to collect. This is no, not necessarily an exhaustive list, but in his list, I just wanted to show you that dissolution test requirement failure is uh, number two uh, uh, in that list after impurities and degradation. I just wanted to put that in context there. So the case example I want to share with you is metopro generic metoprolol succinate ER. And <clears throat> so I still recall when I left FDA in October 2005 and, and um, so the QBD aspects were just emerging and so forth and the new, new drugs are moving forward to PAT but the generics were not. And here is an example of a uh, CMC Biofarm review of a ab abbreviated new drug application. The key aspect was the dissolution, and and I'm I'm not going to read through that. Uh, but the whole point was uh, uh, FDA then insist on uh, uh, later on to to adopt uh, dissolution, which are the compendial specification, and 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 often this happens again after the bio study is done, and so so. How dissolution is a very critical quality attribute from the perspective of the performance. Dissolution testing is the mode uh, for us to design our pro products to, to meet certain criteria. And, and we know that dissolution method are formulation specific because of hydrodynamic issues and other aspects. And the tendency to force everybody to meet a certain compendial requirement was so strong I think more recently, literally every modified release dosage form has their own resolution specification in a monograph and which actually defeats the purpose of a monograph in that sense. But this remains an issue that that uh, that is exhibited in what happens uh, uh, until more recently. Now. In 2014, there were a number of recalls of companies or Indian companies. I, I just blocked out the name because that's not relevant here. I know both companies. I work for one. And uh, in 2007, um, there was a massive recall of the first generic, which was another company, which I also worked for after I left FDA. So I have an sort of insider view of the challenges there. And in, in 2007, um, um, uh, this pharmacy advocate wrote to alert FDA Office of General about problems patients were reporting with the medication. We were told, in essence, we'll get back to you. We have heard nothing. And, and as a result of massive recalls uh, from the Indian companies in 2014, um, FDA did a lot of testing, including bio study, and found the products to be acceptable. But the point I want to emphasize here is the FDA spokesperson comes out and say, we have done the study, multi, multidiscipline, nothing is wrong with the product. He said the recalls were the result of company's own test. 
So putting the pieces together, I want you to think about um, how we design products, how we address measurement certainty, how we set regulatory specifications, what should the difference be between market standards and quality control test. And, and I think the whole idea for PAT continuous manufacturing has been to shift away from that to go to real time release. And uh, what are the challenges people still encounter there given this backdrop? And I think, um, does it make sense that with all that has happened, with the center director making this point, when the solution became a national security issue, when the, the Office of Compliance is reminding everyone that, look, these are market standards. They don't rep non, do not necessarily represent that. And then we know the data for, for, for basis of the PAT. That, and we still say, recalls were a result of company's own test. At one point, Dr. Woodcock was so frustrated, I said, we can take the horse to water, but we can't make them drink it. And I think that is an apt metaphor here. More recently, as an advisor to a company, um, I think I was helping them to resolve a, a complete response letter. And clearly, the, the reviews have changed, has become more scientific. Here, for example, they're looking at uh, uh, scanning electron micrograph for the beaded um, metoprolol succinate product and trying to understand what are the critical factors and so forth. But, but, FDA then insists on a double whammy. Therefore, we recommend you set in process drug release acceptance criteria for the final coated pellet, which should be the same as that of the final product or should not be different. So now dissolution test has moved to in process. You have a double whammy. You have that test which can be variable and we still have measurement certainty. Now you're doing twice. What is the likelihood of ever getting right first time in this case? And in a sense, furthermore, in this case, in this particular case, uh, maintain commercial batch size uh, to the exhibit batch because we have recognized the complexity now and the, the standard default setting of 10x and so forth are being challenged, but our mindset has not shifted yet from uh, process control uh, um, to process control from process testing and testing that too with a market standard. I think that, that's the gap that remains to be filled. So to put this in a big picture context, um, what I've done here is created a big picture. So in 2017, uh, the Bloomberg uh, headline said, US generic drug market in chaos, Indian upstarts rise. Generic pill color changes may affect medication adherence, 2013. FDA moves to increase generic competition. Continuous manufacturing has a strong impact on drug quality. Fed up with drug companies, hospitals decide to start their own. And suffocating silence prevented us from questioning rot in the system. This is uh, Dinesh Thakur, who was a whistleblower in Ranbaxy. And this is sort of frustrations that remain. So in that sense, you have a, a huge, in 2013-14, a huge cluster of uh, breaches in assurance of data integrity warning. Uh, one company I worked for, all companies I have been consulted, so I have, have struggled with that. So here is um, the challenge, and here are the consequences in the real world, and the solution um, is continuous manufacturing is the way to think about that. But how practical? Do we have the expertise? Do we have all? So these, this, this is a very complex task. And I really think uh, Bloomberg uh, title hit it on the head. Chaos. Extreme sensitivity to initial condition, to our raw materials, to our calibrator tablets, to our measurement system, to us uh, is the reason for the chaos that existed years before the 2019 COVID-19 pandemic. The chaos we are in now is a thousand times bigger chaos than what we had before. But we are in chaos, uh, no, any way you think about it. 
So let me sort of end my talk with, with some closing thoughts. We started the PAT initiative for reasons I have talked to you about. Uh, I remember creating a Vision 2020. I can see clearly now. The idea then was uh, quality and performance by design continuous real-time monitoring of quality, specification based on mechanistic understanding of how formulation and process factors impact product performance, highest efficiency and capacity utilization, real-time review and inspections from Rockville, White Oak, and New Jersey District. That was uh, that was where I had anticipated we would reach in 2020. We are not there yet, and few companies, uh, few uh, companies have moved towards continuous manufacturing. Yet many of them come back to struggle with setting dissolution specification. Uh, and, 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 and setting dissolution specification, changing the dissolution test for a real-time release uh, system is, is a paramount, is a huge amount of work because you have to go back and recalibrate, reestablish all the correlation, the chemometric model. Oh, this can be very frustrating. And this is something we have to still work on. So I had not anticipated coming back to pharma. After working for Novartis, I had moved on to Philip Morris, uh, um, uh, um, um, for the next generation product worked on making vaccines in tobacco plant, H5N1 pandemic vaccine was one of the projects. And then I focused my attention on on um, a modified risk tobacco product, uh, um, the product which was approved recently by FDA's ICOS, uh, helped them set the structure, arch set um, evidence architecture for that as, as a chief scientific officer. But I wanted to come back. But I didn't. I thought I, I would retire after that. But I was pulled into uh, pharma again in India, uh, my home country, to to reconnect. And so I have been thinking about these challenges and be writing this on my blog on LinkedIn. I started my journey, what I call Schrodinger's cat, and my journey from 2015 to 2020, hoping to see clearly now. And I hope the clarity that I have been able to gain in, in what are the root cause or univariate and multivariate uh, aspect to, to sort of re reflect on, on where, where, where we started, where we are and where we need to go. I think, uh, I hope I can, I, my, my, my discussion helps you to appreciate uh, the work to be done and where we do we need to go. I think pharmaceuticals beyond 2020, our responsibilities are humongous. As, as a community of knowledge, uh, we are essentially called upon to bring back the world economies uh, with, uh, with medicines, not only for COVID, but um, I think with the geopolitical tensions and the chaos that is ensuing, uh, we have a tremendous responsibility on our shoulders together. So I think overcoming legacy challenge to, ad to advance manufacturing uh, with real-time controls and corp uh, controls both corporate and regulatory, I think is now honing down on advanced manufacturing with real-time control. I don't like the term continuous manufacturing because that confuses people. I, I prefer advanced manufacturing with real-time controls. I think the journey ahead is from chaos to continual improvement, which a article I wrote for uh, for the CPHI Frankfurt. And if you if you have the slides, you can just click on that image. You can download that article. And I think uh, I think it's a useful because I see the journey ahead is to go from chaos to continual improvement. And how do we do that? I think we have to think from a multivariate perspective. We have to think about our starting conditions, starting conditions of our raw materials, of our people, and of everything raw materials, uh, I think, uh, is, is one of the key gaps that we have so that we diminish the sensitivity of our process to the starting conditions and not create uh, the butterfly effect in a negative sense. So. I think um, the, we are still struggling to achieve statistical process control. We are still struggling to do multivariate uh, corrective action, preventive actions. We are still stuck in OS univariate. And I think the, the expectation is we will move into continu continual improvement mode, which was ICH uh, uh, Q13, uh, well, uh, I forget what number, and to, to continuous ma manufacturing. But I think the key there is measurement uncertainty 
to science-based risk assessment is the path uh, to coming from uh, chaos to continual improvement. And um, I just want you to think about uh, the, the, if these two islands are systems, what is in between is disorder and chaos. And disorder and chaos is increasing all around us. Supply chains are getting disrupted. So the challenges I see with respect to raw materials, um, um, bringing manufacturing back to U.S., these are very serious challenges. And to transform pharmaceutical manufacturing, we cannot do that unless we transform ourselves to be uh, more suitable and capable in the level of complexity that we have to face and we have to build a critical mass so that what we do is reliable and predictable. I, I, I worry about the challenge of making vaccines uh, for, for the globe uh, in this uh, challenge and in, in warp speed and so forth. And this is, I think we have to take a moment to reflect on how do we transform ourselves to transform manufacturing, I think is a key point I wish to emphasize. So I'll end my talk here. I see the journey ahead as chaos to continual improvement. Assurance bridge between clinical and real world is real. And um, we can only transform uh, our manufacturing when we transform ourselves. Thank you for listening. And I hope this was useful for you. Well, thank you, Ajaz, for that excellent presentation. If you have any questions for Ajaz and have not already submitted them, please do so and we'll forward them to Ajaz, who will get back to you by email. Remember, you can submit questions to any of our speakers at any time, even when they're not presenting, and we'll forward them to the speaker after the event. Do remember to identify which speaker you are directing the question to. To submit your question, click the Ask a Question button below the player window, type in your question, identify who the question is for, and click OK.